Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Amit. Uh, I worked about, uh, I work with Python uh, almost nine years, uh, currently working in a high frequency trading firm uh, called QSpark. Um, in one word, high frequency trading is the ability to trade in the US markets, for example, uh, using algorithms that trade in the micro and the nanosecond. Um, uh, trading in the US market brings a lot of challenges uh, in terms of data and data throughput. Um, and basically, I really love Python. Um, I'm working with all the awesome packages you all know, Django, Django OS Framework, Fast, and such. And having the time of my life. Um, everything is created for me. I just need to import things, and it works. Um, so today, I'm going to explain my journey. Uh, in the high frequency world, uh, when we're writing services in Python. And I'm going to show two main problems I had and how I dealt with them and how PyPy, which is the main topic, uh, helped me get fast and fu furious. Um, so what's our goals? I will explain the two main problems when I had uh, issues when writing services uh, that needed low latency. Um, I will uh, do a quick review of what is PyPy. We, we know we use PyPy. <laughs> Who thinks I won't use that information? Great. Uh, and I will showcase some cool tricks that help me get fast. Okay, let's start. Um, problem number one: in the in the market uh, exchanges, brokers, the global language called Fix. Fix stands for um, Financial Information Exchange. This is a language, a, a format that helps uh, us trade in the markets against the brokers, and it's like a language. Um, and we use it every day. We use it for uh, communication and just for some numbers. I get um, uh, between 200 and 300 million events per day. Um, from the exchanges, the brokers, and such, and I need to parse them. Um, and the issue is not that number, it's the peaks. So in the US market, there, there is the opening, which open, uh, happens at 9.30 a.m., and the closing, which happens at 4 p.m. And between the, these times, everything is fine. But at the peaks, I get almost 200K messages at a second, and I am having some problems. So how a fixed message looks. Um, as you can see, there is, this is a string format. And, and it's splitted by a special character. And between the splits, there is a key value, which is splitted in an equal sign. So basically, if you split by the special character, you get the key value. And then you can create a dictionary of the tag and the value. Um, the tag is an enum. Uh, in order to make the data more small, and some of the values also are enums. For example, 35 stands for message type, and D stands for new order single. That means I want to create a new order in the market. Um, so parsing in fixed event. Uh, I have a service which gets that events in real time by our trading uh, machines and from the broker. And basically, I need to process everything in a really decent time, which can be one, two, three milliseconds, in order to uh, analyze uh, and process this data and show the right numbers every time. Um, and as I say, as I uh, told you guys, um, I get a lot of data and a lot of throughput. So um, I took some code from my fixed parser to demonstrate. And as you can see, we will go over it uh, really, uh, really fast. And you can see I get a fixed message. And I split it by the special character. And for each split, I also do a split to get the tag and the value and return a dictionary. Uh, small notice, I use partition and not split in the second in line 9, because I benchmarked and partition worked better uh, for the specific text. Um, so that's really easy, right? That looks uh, elegant and simple and understandable. And so I benchmarked it. I started to write my services in C Python, of course, uh, because that's uh, the convenient way. And the performance were, that looks OK, uh, almost 9 microseconds per fixed event. But um, you need to understand that 
you, in the closing, I get gaps. I, I get delay. And I process, it's not fast enough. And that uh, delay causes showing the wrong uh, numbers, the wrong exposure of the firm. Um, it causes the risk management in the application to work not, not good. It calculates against uh, wrong data. Um, so I had that problem, and I needed to fix that as soon as possible. And I tried many things. I uh, tried to understand the bottlenecks. I did, uh, um, as you may know, C profile or profile, and started to look uh, in the assembly code and did some reverse engineering. And this is a small example of the C profile of the code I, I just mentioned. And as you can, can, can see, there is nothing interesting because everything is using the C Python uh, methods. Uh, so it's useless, uh, at least uh, for now. Um, I tried different data structures. Uh, maybe some of you uh, uh, data, uh, data science students and uh, immediately uh, remember the data structures uh, lessons that in, in your head trying to think, maybe I create an array with all the tags numbers and uh, each, uh, each item in the array will go to the value. Uh, I tried it and uh, it's not working well and there is tons of memory. Um, so I tried uh, a different approach. I created, I created the latency sensitive code, which is the parsing in uh, C and tried to use C extensions. Uh, C extensions are, is the ability to create code in C and eventually use it in Python and convert uh, your uh, data structures in C to Py objects. The code looks like this. Uh, I won't go over it. It's, it's not important. Uh, the only things I want to mention is I tried to use the boost library. There is a boost Python uh, a library that uh, enables, I thought at least, that it will help me create dictionaries faster in Python, and it's not. And I tried to avoid using Python methods, of course, uh, so everything is plain C. And I had in my mind said that using uh, tags, as you can see, the char array maybe will make it faster instead Python objects, um, and it didn't. Uh, my guess is because the, but when you're using C extensions, maybe the moving between the C code and Python, it's slowing me down. I'm not 100% sure, but it didn't work. Uh, and it not, that, it not just didn't work, I needed to maintain, maintain a C library code, which sucks. Um, okay, so I did some research and before the research, uh, I did what every good developer does. I go to the product manager and said, it's impossible. Um, and he didn't like that. Um, so I did some research and I uh, found something called PyPy. Um, so what is PyPy? PyPy is a fast compliant alternative implementation of the Python language. What that means? Um, it's an implementation of the Python specification, of the Python spec, uh, that follows the spec and the test suits the, um, with some unique features. That means that every code you can write in Python, you can run it with PyPy, and it should work. Uh, there are some unique uh, um, conditions, but I will talk about them later. Um, that means that C Python is an interpreter of Python spec, and PyPy is another interpreter. And what's so cool about uh, PyPy? Two things, at least for me. Uh, the first one is the JIT. Uh, PyPy implements something called JIT, which is just in time compilation, uh, which gives us the ability, give PyPy the ability to understand your most critical code. Uh, that basically most of the time is running in loops or uh, uh, getting called uh, uh, regularly and uh, move it, compile it from the bytecodes to assembly code and from that on it will use the optimized code. Um, of course the JIT, like any other JIT, is uh, running in the runtime. That means that you don't need to do anything unique, you just need to run with PyPy and the uh, a really awesome algorithm will uh, understand uh, the code and will optimize it. Um, 
I will talk about it later. Uh, another really awesome uh, thing in PyPy is the garbage collector. Uh, as you may all know, CPython has garbage collector, uh, just like uh, many other languages. Um, but the garbage collector implementation in PyPy is uh, different. The strategy is different and more, more unique. And we will see how to tweak it and make it faster. Um, so let's get back to our code, which is really simple and elegant. Um, so I took the same code and ran it in CPython and PyPy. And the benchmarks were really good. I went from nine microseconds to oh, between two and three microseconds per fixed message, uh, which is good enough for me, good enough for, for the closing peaks and the opening peaks, and even the huge days such as Russell and uh, index changing days, which are very volatile. Um, the, the application worked. And this is, was amazing. I did nothing. I basically did nothing. I, I wrote the entire C extension and it didn't work and just replaced the interpreter and it works. I was amazed. Um, so I tried to understand why. Because CPython is fast. It's, it's written in C. It should be awesome. It should be fast. And so I tried to uh, look uh, about the, the slowness in CPython. So I did some measurements, and eventually the split method in CPython took all the time. Uh, the, from the nine microseconds, most of the time was the split method. Um, but I did not understand why. So I went to the CPython source code and looked at the split uh, .h code. And learned the, the code and the code was well optimized. It was uh, really, it's really simple by the way, you can go and look and it was well optimized and it was easy and it worked well. But the only thing that I thought is related is the comment I saw in the code, which talk about large, large strings that are splitted by the same character. And I had the feeling it's maybe related uh, because the fixed message are quite large. I gave a small example, but they are large. Um, and maybe in the split method, in order to uh, return a list, uh, there, there, are, there is some reallocation um, because the split method is not aware of, of how much data you need to split. Um, so I had that in mind. So I told myself, OK, let's, let's not use split. Let's do something else. Uh, so I came up with a really ugly code that works. Um, and basically what it does, it's not using split. It just go character by character and do, does some conditions. For example, if I get a, a special character, it means that I ended a block. If I get the equal sign, it means that I finished to read a tag. And then I need to read the value. And it works really great. Um, it's not readable at all. And eventually, I tried to benchmark that. And I thought myself, OK, maybe in CPython it will work better. In PyPy it will, woo! And no. Um, in CPython it worked really well. Uh, but in PyPy it's, it went worse. Um, and I was like, what? Uh, yeah, all the teammates, uh, I've talked to myself in the work. So I <laughs> um, so I tried to understand why. So I went to the documentation of PyPy and I read a bit and I came to the conclusion that the just-in-time compilation in PyPy is well optimized for simple code. Simple and code that using Python uh, methods. So using that code, PyPy could not understand it and could not optimize it well. Why the the, the code before using the split method and the partition and the int and such. And it, it performed well, it better. So eventually, um, I decided to use Py, uh, PyPy because I get more clean code, I get fast performance, and you need to understand this is one optimization. PyPy increased the speed of my application in many different parts, in the async I.O. part, in the HTTP server, in the queues, in the uh, Kafka producer and consumers, and everything went really fast. So I used PyPy and I'm really happy. Um, 
So that's one problem. Uh, let's talk about the other problem. So I fixed that one and everything, everyone was happy and then I had another requirement. Um, the second problem that I had, I needed to calculate something they call unrealized PNL. So let's talk about the term, okay? PNL in the finance world stands for profit and loss. How much I gained from the trading, how much I lost from the tra trading. Uh, so the term is PNL. Um, in the finance world, everyone loves to, to have some really not understandable terms. So this is one of these, them. Um, so what is unrealized PNL? Let's take an example. Let's say I buy from the US market 100 stocks of Apple at $100. Now I, I have a position of 100 stocks. They're mine. Um, let's say one minute pass. And the price in the market is not $100, it's $100.1. .1. So, what's my unrealized PNL? $10. Why? Because it's 100 stocks. Uh, multiply the difference of the price that is in the market now and the price that uh, I bought. Um, so, that's what's called unrealized PNL. Um, so, as you guys uh, may uh, know, um, in order to calculate unrealized PNL, we need to know the prices in the market. Um, and the prices in the market change regularly a lot. That means that in one microsecond, I, get, I can get thousands of changes. In one second, I get 100K of changes. And in order to, to track down the prices, I need to be fast enough. Um, so I would do, I get the data. Uh, so I get feed from various sources. It can be the exchange markets. It can be another sources. And I get a feed, which is a UDP socket. And, and uh, UDP socket is not, uh, it's not like TCP. You may, if you're not fast enough, you may lose data. And how I know that I can lose data? Because every packet in the UDP socket, in the protocol, as a sequence number. So I know how much uh, packets I lost when I read a specific uh, packet. I can just trace down the, the sequence number. Um, so what do, we, do I get from the UDP socket? I get the, 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 the buy or sell side. I get the amount of, uh, of the trade and I get the price. Uh, and even from which exchange. Um, I can get a, a new trade from NICE, then a different trade from NASDAQ, and the last trade is the trade in the entire US market. Um, the dat data I get uh, is in binary, sp uh, custom binary protocol, uh, which means uh, it should be fast to parse it. Um, so this is a small example of how I, I, how I uh, use uh, the feed, I connect it uh, using this, uh, the socket uh, module and I use the struct module in order to parse it. Um, so what I tried, uh, I had gaps, okay? I had a lot of gaps, especially in the at the closing, which is hysterical. Um, so I tried the various things. I tried to I tried to measure CPython and I, I found out the struct uh, module and the socket module was fast. However, PyPy was faster. Um, cool, cool thing, you can go to the PyPy website and go to the speed center and see every module uh, benchmark. Um, I tried to use uh, the async IO module. I have multiple feeds, so I tried to use the same event loop for multiple feeds and oh, I failed <laughs> miserably. Um, the async IO uh, is giving some overhead, uh, so eventually I spread it to different processes. Uh, however, I had some really unique issue uh, with the gaps, because the code uh, was running in PyPy, it should be fast, but I, this is, uh, but I got some gaps. And this is a graph of how much gaps I had in different time. And as you can see, it's not related to the trading at all. It's not related to the to rush hours or rush minutes on some uh, uh, news. It's just random picks. And I had some uh, thought about the garbage collector. Uh, I thought to myself, maybe the garbage collector causing me this. And I took some inspiration from uh, the PyPy blog to, to go and check it out. And 
and I thought some very interesting things. Interesting things. So let's talk about the garbage collector in two seconds. Uh, the C Python garbage collection is is using the strategy called uh, reference counting, which is as 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 uh, as you have uh, references to your object from uh, methods, from uh, variables, and such. Until you you do delete to the object, you get a reference counting. Once you don't have a reference counting, the garbage collector deletes the object. It may delete it immediately. It may be it may do it cyclic. It depends. Um, the PyPy garbage collector uh, implements different strategy. It's called InCinemark, uh, which is an incremental garbage collection. Um, so what InCinemark does is when you start the project, the program, uh, and run it, um, the PyPy creates uh, something called nursery. It's allocating a memory. Um, it defaults for megabytes. And every time you create a new object in PyPy, it just alloc it just giving the pointer of the next memory pointer. So you don't create memory every time you need uh, you need a new object. It just gi gi giving you a pointer from the nursery. As you may know, uh, Python uh, every the string, the int, everything is by object. So it's it's really easy. You don't need to create anything. You just need to give a pointer. And once the nursery is full, there is a garbage collection. And there, there, there is something called minor collection and major collection, and I don't think I have time to talk about it, so let's continue. Um, so I tried to tweak the garbage collection in PyPy. And in PyPy, there is a lot of ways to tweak it. Um, there are environment variables uh, that I used, such as the nursery size, uh, which is defaulted for megabytes. I increased it a bit, and it helped. Um, I did uh, the, gar the garbage collector minimum threshold, which means uh, if the memory size is not five gigabytes, don't do collection at all. Uh, it helped me until I had five gigabytes, and then the garbage collection happened, and I had some gaps. And the last one is growth, uh, which means uh, how much uh, at peaks uh, when you create a lot of memory, don't do garbage collection. OK. Um, so. Eventually, currently, I have a tailored solution. Uh, recently, a PyPy developer uh, created a branch that gives you the ability to disable garbage collection in runtime and, and, and collect manually. So I know the trading times. I know when I'm not trading. And when I'm not trading, I don't care. I don't get data. I can do garbage collection as, as much as I want. So I have machine with a lot of memory. And I don't do garbage collection at all. I just wait to the close or to 8 PM when the exchanges are closed officially. And I just do garbage collection then. Um, and it really reduced my gaps to almost nothing. And this was really, uh, really amazing. Um, I want to talk about really small trick. Uh, as I, as I uh, said before, uh, the JIT is not working from the beginning. You need to understand the code. So uh, I wanted to have no gaps from the first minute. So in order to do that, what I did is, uh, before listening to the UDP socket, I just ran a loop with my critical code uh, methods uh, for uh, some samples uh, thousands of times, and then started to, uh, reading the UDP socket. Uh, I'm not sure if it's helping at all. I I saw that it's helping most of the time. Um, I can't control the JIT at the moment. I, I really hope that uh, the PyPy uh, community will give you the ability someday. Um, but it helped me. And the results. Application faster, um, product manager faster. I'm, first, I'm happy because I don't need to use C. Uh, and I can use Py uh, Python. And I can keep my services in Python. Um, so I don't have a lot of time, uh, but when not to use PyPy? When you don't need really super uh, fast application, because CPython is fast enough for most of the things. And you need to understand that PyPy currently is, is in 3.6 beta. That means that it's not up to date with current uh, Python spec. And it slows it, gains it, but it takes time. And it's hard to combine the new version of Python with PyPy because uh, I can't use data classes, variable annotations, and really neat uh, stuff I like. Yeah, that's it. Amazing. Thank you. Let's talk. Let's talk outside.